Bitcoin, today is Sunday, December 31st, 2017, the last day of the year. My name is Thomas Hunt, and here's what's happening today in Bitcoin. The price of Bitcoin was up 9.69% in the last 24 hours, with a last of 14,022, a high of 14,189, and a low of 12,647. That's $1 for 7,243 Satoshis. Still seems a long way away from the 5,000 Satoshi barrier. Bitcoin is climbing on the last day of 2017. Investors still wary of Bitcoin. Is Bitcoin a risk to wider financial markets? All right, we've covered the mainstream media. And now on to Coinbase. Coinbase is a digital currency wallet service that allows traders to buy and sell Bitcoin. Coinbase has been funded for more than $225 million, started on June 1st, 2012 by Brian Armstrong and Fred Ursum. Coinbase is active, a late-stage venture with Series D funding. As you all know, Coinbase is not adopting SegWit for unknown reasons. I asked Coinbase when SegWit, after they were embarrassed seeing Julian Assange now supporting SegWit, Coinbase replied, in 2018. They didn't reply quarter one, quarter two, like a company. They replied like a major motion picture company. In 2018, trailers coming soon, which is a really pathetic response from Coinbase. They're a big company. They should say nothing at all or give us some reasonable information that an investor could deal with. Oh, it's coming in Q3. That's going to affect my product or that's going to affect this service. And you, know, you could make judgments and things like that but they didn't provide us any information about the most important upgrade in bitcoin which they aren't doing meanwhile bitcoin cash buys and sells have been enabled on coinbase availability may fluctuate over the current days oh and coinbase investigates possible trading insider trading of bitcoin cash that's right they can't even launch a new coin right when all they want to do is launch new coins to get those sweet sweet fees as the president and CEO of Coinbase says, we're not so much an exchange, but more of a reality show, exciting you about the, what the next crypto offering could be. The next crypto offering. Great reality show host right here. And today we're joined by Pierre Rochard, software engineer, Bitcoin maximalist, and co-host on the Noted podcast. How's it going, Pierre? Welcome to the show. It's going very well. Thanks for having me on, Thomas. It's great to have you here. And uh, as the audience knows, you recently had a, a tweet storm, a series of tweets, I'll pull up right here, uh, where you pitched to the creditors of Coinbase. You said, I can turn this exchange around. And you had some uh, pretty simple points that we'll just go over here to get the discussion started. Uh, your first point is along the lines of what I said in the introduction, implement SegWit. Uh, why should Coinbase implement SegWit? Why are they not implementing it right now? Well, there, there are large sorts of transactions on the Bitcoin network. So if they implemented SegWit, not only would they be saving on fees themselves, but they would also be freeing up block space and helping bring the overall, reduce the pressure of the fee market overall. Um, so I think that they, they're probably not implementing it due to their, they've got other priorities. Uh, and it's not that they, they got to make money, right? Do, do they make any money from this upgrade? It's just their customers save money. The network runs better. But what about Coinbase? What about Big Mama? She's got to get fed. That, that's right. right. They, they pass on the fee to customers, so they don't really care that much. It doesn't affect their bottom line. Now, originally, they did have a different strategy. Coinbase was paying for all of the Bitcoin fees because Bitcoin fees were so low and Coinbase was so rich. Uh, but so that's actually, changed now, right? Uh, that's right on the brokerage side. On the exchange side at GDAX, they actually do still allow people to withdraw without a fee, uh, which might not actually be a good idea in the sense that you could spam Coinbase and make them pay for a lot of fees. But um, I, I, well, I think that the they withdrawals have... are to the bank accounts, right? For free, not like withdrawing Bitcoin or you can No, send. you can withdraw. You can withdraw Bitcoins from GDEX. So the move is that you transfer your coins from the Coinbase exchange, if that's where you have them, to GDEX. And then you hit the withdraw button and you get a free withdrawal. And I think that's to be competitive with other exchanges like like Gemini. I think Gemini allows you to have like six free exchanges a, a year or a month or something. 
Um, so it's it's rationed, but uh, yeah, I, th I think that in any case, implementing SegWit would be to the benefit of the whole ecosystem. But I, the other thing too is that uh, I think that among Coinbase uh, employees and leadership, they don't really care about Bitcoin anymore. They care about Ethereum and uh, the possibilities there. So they really would rather just cripple the Bitcoin user experience and help push people towards either Ethereum or uh, Bcash. So, so how did we get to this point? How did Coinbase, which started off as an easy way to buy Bitcoin, and everyone told their friends, if you need an easy way to buy Bitcoin, you use Coinbase. How did they become this altcoin promoting monster? Yeah, I think that Brian really didn't, Brian Armstrong, the co-founder and CEO of Coinbase, didn't really understand Bitcoin from the get-go. And uh, it, his understanding of Bitcoin worsened as we got deeper into the previous bear market. Uh, we saw a lot of people in the previous bear market kind of uh, get interested in uh, distributed decentralized applications that are non-currency, non-monetary. We also saw people kind of just go into the blockchain technology, uh, providing database uh, enterprise solutions to financial services firms. So uh, crap that's really not Bitcoin. Uh, and that becomes apparent if, if you Google the Coinbase secret, secret master plan uh, dated September 7th, 2016, uh, Brian laid it out, which is that uh, phase one was the protocol, whatever the fuck that means, uh, TCP, IP, SMTP for internet, and then for digital currency, Bitcoin and Ethereum. So, I mean, to me, that that, that premise is, is to, to call that a protocol phase doesn't make sense to me. Uh, I think the the phase there is where he really means is money, um, but I, it's not really clear to me. Anyway, uh, and then the phase two would be the infrastructure, so exchanges and secure storage. Okay, sure, that's uncontroversial. Uh, I don't know what the reach is about because the reach of exchanges and secure storage, there's no reason why that wouldn't be much greater than 10 million. Um, and if if the money is successful, uh, then the reach is uh, you know seven billion humans on the planet. Everyone has access to the internet. Uh, worst case scenario, they hook up to a Blockstream satellite, whatever. Anyway, th so number three, consumer interface, user controlled wallet, a hundred million people. I don't know why he caps it at hundred million people. You could easily have, uh, especially now that we're developing layer two solutions like Lightning, have uh, user controlled wallets for an arbitrary number of people. Uh, and then decentralized apps. Uh, honestly, I think decentralized apps are complete bullshit. So I don't. I wouldn't even uh, think about number four for too long. So anyway, it, each each phase, it's like he put them in an arbitrary order, and he also capped the their reach at an arbitrary level. And I don't think this vision maps to the reality of what we're seeing, which is that we're seeing a monetary phenomenon of uh, Bitcoin going from being a digital commodity to being a digital money and thus dramatically increasing in value uh, and increasing in speculators' interest in it. So basically, over the past 15 months, uh, Coinbase has been executing on this vision. And I think that uh, Brian's view is that we're past phase two, we're, we're past the phase of exchanges, which is crazy. Like he should have been spending all of that time making sure that the exchange scales so that we don't have uh, service interruptions when the price goes bananas. And I think well, that- and, and let's, let's talk about the scope of yeah. what you're defining there. Brian is the head of a Bitcoin company. Uh, like I said earlier, their main job was to sell people Bitcoin. New people come in, they have a credit card, they have a bank account, they leave with some Bitcoin, right? It was a pretty simple job. How does he begin describing the entire industry and then leading the whole industry here? Isn't it too much? Aren't, aren't they taking on way too much? Yeah, I, I'm a big believer that a company should be focused and executing on its core competency. And in this case, the Coinbase core competency is providing an on and off ramp, an interface between the world of fiat and the world of cryptocurrencies. 
And you know, I'm a Bitcoin maximalist, but I'm also a realist about the fact that uh, Bitcoin does not have 100% market share. It has you know somewhere between 40 and 80% market share. So, and as far as that's the case, then it makes sense to me that Coinbase would have altcoins uh, on their platform as well. Uh, but I think that to then go into decentralized apps with the crypto kittens and the Toshi Ethereum messaging app. That part doesn't make sense to me at all. They're, they're also making a very unclear offering as a customer. I know that lots of people, I send them to Coinbase to get their first Bitcoins. They come back with Litecoin or Ethereum because it's cheaper. Also, the interface doesn't explain that you can buy a 0.001 of a Bitcoin. There are many easy ways to do this. A pop-up window automatically filling in like $20 of Bitcoin. Hey, you can get 0.001 for $20 or whatever it is. There's none of that. The, the interface is bad. Yeah, I agree. And I th that, that was my second point, which is that they should move all of the altcoins to different domain names so that people can go to coinbase.com and just get a straight up Bitcoin experience. And if they want to dabble with other shit coins, they can go onto these different domains and uh, buy that there. Uh, I think that would, than... that would also give them the chance to have more education about these altcoins. When you look at them right now, they just have names. They don't even have a paragraph. Ethereum is a smart contract system. Litecoin is a copy of Bitcoin, whatever you want to call these things. There's no attempt to inform the consumer at all. So people make these uneducated choices. And then this market's so crazy. A lot of people have made money on Litecoin and Ethereum by uh, purchasing them by mistake or by accident. Uh, so maybe they're right. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, and I think it, 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 these altcoins deserve to have a platform to themselves as well. I'm not just saying this as, uh, you know, just as a Bitcoin maximalist who selfishly wants Bitcoin on its own. I think that you could, you know, put together good marketing pieces for all these different altcoins and uh, have them using some of the same underlying Coinbase infrastructure, but with a different domain and thus a different brand and um they can compete on on their own merits rather than competing on a oh bitcoin cash is less expensive than bitcoin i guess i should buy that which is a completely crazy way of investing in this space. And, and we're having a, a brand war time at the same time where people are trying to take the name bitcoin so competing on your own merit sounds like a foreign idea in this space everyone's just trying to steal from the others yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And on on the on the uh, point that you were making about the price, though, I think that that does speak to the need of uh, the industry moving to a smaller denomination. I know that bits is controversial, but it actually is my favorite one, where uh, one bitcoin would equal a million bits, and then uh, you know a, a hundred satoshis is one bit. I think that makes sense to me, but. Uh, there was a BIP put forward, uh, a Bitcoin improvement proposal put forward by Jimmy Selling, and I think that that has gotten a lot of uh, traction. So hopefully we'll see that move and then Bitcoin will be the uh, cheapest coin on the platform once again. Yeah, I'm on the other side of this one. I mean, I okay. think that if you, I understand everyone's point why they want to change the units and why they think it'll make it simpler and cheaper and all these things. But for me, it's just people should learn how to use decimals and otherwise, I'm always going to have to answer this question. Oh, I thought you were sending me a 0 0.01 of a Bitcoin, but now I have a thousand or something or a million of something or whatever it is. They're always going to have to convert it back into Bitcoin in my mind. Uh, it seems yeah. like if you if you got everybody to switch tomorrow and everyone was like, OK, we're all switching, it would work. But you're not going to get everybody to switch. We can't even get the United States on the metric system. Uh, so that's my side. Yeah, it's a it, tough one for sure. sure. I, I, I agree. I agree that it's, uh, it's a tough, tough one. All right, so let's move on to your, your third point, which you said hire 30 site, re site reliability engineers from Google. Uh, why would Coinbase need these? Well, because their, their site is down so often. Uh, so, you know, I'd have to kind of get in there to understand why that is, but uh, they definitely need a help in that regard. And Google is known to train and uh, hire the best site reliability engineers. So, Hopefully getting them on board would help stabilize the platform and make sure that the uh, uptime is what we would expect from a financial services company. 
And we, we have seen some large new hires from Coinbase recently, but they mainly seem to be people from the financial industry. Uh, we're seeing a lot of large executives joins, people with connections to Goldman or existing markets, things like that. Uh, I'm not sure that we've seen a technological takeover at Coinbase, especially since Charlie Lee left. A lot of people thought Charlie Lee was kind of whispering in Brian's shoulder, giving him the technical details, explaining to him how things work. And uh, now that I think they're much poorer without Charlie. Yeah, yeah, and I, I I can't speak to that because uh, you know you kind of have to work with someone to to understand the dynamics there, but uh, for sure. And Brian Brian has an engineering background. Um, I I don't know how rigorous it was and what what I mean. There are bad software engineers out there, um, but regardless, yeah, I think getting more uh, site reliability engineers would be to Coinbase's benefit and benefit the ecosystem. All right, your next point gets a little technical. You might have to explain to people what these things are, but yeah, you sure. say that you'll migrate the back end from MongoDB to Postgres SQL. I said it wrong, but yeah. That's okay. Yeah, Postgres SQL. There's there's a million ways of pronouncing it. Um so basically, uh, MongoDB is a document storage database uh, and Postgres SQL is a relational database and when it comes to financial transactions, you generally want to be using a relational database. And you would want to use MongoDB for uh, maybe like a social media use case where you don't need uh, atomic transactions, basically. Uh, and on the, uh, on the brokerage side, they currently use MongoDB based on my analysis of their job postings. So I think that that needs to change uh, ASAP. And I think that it would, it's just bad engineering that they're in that kind of situation. Now, part of the complexity here when we, uh, we're about to go to number four, which you say move GDAX to a dedicated Equinox Colo. So again, we're talking about reliability and uptime. For me, just as an outsider looking at the idea of Coinbase, they have all these different accounts with people's money in them and they have to settle at the same time. If I changed my money on one server and I changed my money on another server and they didn't match up, or I was able to take advantage of that situation, somehow it would be a big problem. So it's not like just Twitter just sends out information. They're an information website. They need a bunch of servers to send out more information, but it doesn't really matter if you get it from this server or that server. Right. This would be much more complicated. Does the database tie into that problem? Have they chosen a bad uh, architecture that's left them in this position? Yeah, I think they have. And it, it might be understandable in the sense that back in the day, there was a view that PostgreSQL does not scale as well as MongoDB does. Uh, but now it's pretty clear that there are a number of uh, scaling solutions for PostgreSQL that make it very competitive with MongoDB. And so it's, it's time to uh, upgrade. And then just to go over the technicals again, is this a doable project? Like if you had all the Google engineers, all the Facebook engineers, a couple of guys from Uber, whatever it is, you could get this project done? Or is this like the Manhattan project? No one knows how to do this. No one's built an exchange. This is too complicated. Uh, how no, how I mean, tough it, is the problem? Yeah. Uh, people regularly migrate from MongoDB to PostgreSQL. So it's really not a problem at all. Um, it just, it takes uh, discipline and careful planning. Well, and the, the greater problem of running an exchange like this, uh, Charles Schwab, other companies, they seem to do it fine. Yeah, yeah. And so if we, so let's go to, on that note to uh, move GDAX to dedicated Equinix Colo. So there, uh, if you look at uh, the big equities exchanges in the US and FX exchanges and whatnot, um, you know, BATS, for example. So what, what they'll do is that they'll have a big server room uh, that they'll lease from a company called Equinix. And there you can, so they'll, they'll host the matching engine there. And then traders will lease servers in that same room. And they'll be hooked up directly to that matching engine server. And what that allows you to do is have a high level of reliability uh, from a networking perspective, but also uh, a low latency and you have dedicated hardware. What Coinbase is doing currently, what GDAX is currently doing is that they're on Amazon Web Services. So if you wanna do uh, some order book market making, you have to do it by using their API, their, their, you know, their public API with 
uh, WebSockets and HTTP. And you do it on AWS. And if you're lucky, you can, by the roll of dice, be on a virtual server that is physically close to theirs in their US East Coast uh, facility. But really, this is an amateurish way of doing it. They should professionalize and do it like the big boys do by being at a dedicated facility that it, the intent is for financial trading. And it is different, much like uh, I always tell people, if you had $1,000 in Bitcoin and now you have 10,000, you should store it differently. You should treat it differently. Just like Coinbase, they were a small company, maybe trading a million dollars in Bitcoin. Now they're trading, I don't know, $100 million in Bitcoin, whatever it is. They need to change the way they trade, the way they set up their servers and their infrastructure might not be good for the long haul. You might not be able to do it forever. Uh, if you recall, the Mt. Gox exchange famously had one leader and I think one programmer. Mark Carpellis was running the whole thing. He was very much in control. No one else had any other say. There wasn't any kind of discussion or group work or anything like that, at least looking at it from the outside. I don't know what happened on the inside. But um, it would be sad to see that with Coinbase, to see that with the serious venture capital funded. They seem to have a complex organization. You think they'd be able to do these kind of things, right? Yeah, I agree. And I would actually add on number four, um, I, I think that GDAX should uh, sell its historical data for traders to run automated, um, essentially uh, machine learning algorithms on it and whatnot. And that would attract more of these uh, quote unquote high frequency traders to uh, look for ways of jockeying in the order book and adding liquidity. I think that would be. You've really got to have a robust platform before you bring in the high frequency traders. There's yeah, definitely yeah. Risk. Absolutely. All right, uh, uh, number five. Uh, let's. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, number five. It says have the Toshi ETH team pivot to Lightning development. So first of all, a little background. There's a CryptoKitty team working at Coinbase. They can't get a core developer, but they've got a CryptoKitty developer. Uh, tell us more about this. Yeah, I mean, uh, so the Toshi is like this weird like messaging app that they wrote that is for Ethereum tokens or something. I, I honestly, I, I couldn't be bothered to look that deeply into it. And then I saw the headline that they had integrated with the uh, CryptoKitty um, fad thing. So. As far as I'm concerned, like this is completely off off the rails uh, wankery because like why, if you are trying to establish a new financial system, uh, I don't see CryptoKitties being part of that new financial system. On the other hand, there is serious development happening on the Lightning project and they need as much engineering talent as they can get. And the underpinnings of the Toshi app, which is basically you know a JavaScript interface to a distributed network, you know, that, that team could be working on creating a user-friendly Lightning wallet. And it can be Coinbase branded and all of that. That's, that's fine. Uh, and it can have like special integrations with Coinbase features and whatnot. Uh, but the, the bottom line is that if we look at what is important to be working on today, it's not CryptoKitties, it's Lightning Network. Well, I'm, I'm sensing a, a repetition of tone here. What I'm seeing is the seriousness of Coinbase is at question here. When you look at their trading engine, they're on Amazon instead of Equinox, they don't have the right database, they're not ready for high frequency traders. Now they're working on CryptoKitties instead of the Lightning Network. There's a lack of seriousness, but there's also this idea in my head where Maybe Coinbase is thinking differently than we all think they are. The reason they're into Ethereum, the reason they're into crypto kitties and all these altcoins, maybe they don't have any money. Maybe they need to do these things because they don't have money. Maybe they spent it all or lost it all or locked it up in small amounts in many UTXO accounts or something like that. What do you think of that idea that Coinbase is actually not operating? We're assuming they're operating to be the best Bitcoin exchange they can be, to be the best cryptocurrency company they can be, but maybe something bad happened and now they're operating to try to stay alive. Is, yeah, that's, that's possible. That you know, that that's that's plausible, and that, that's why I began this tweet storm with my pitch to the creditors, which is that hey, if they're going to go out of business, they need uh, some new leadership. I but I actually think that the explanation is uh, a little more innocent than that, and that's that there's a cultural disconnect, 
and in uh, in some of these circles. And we saw this with Vitalik Buterin's uh, virtue signaling tweet about how, oh, guys, you know, gosh, we make so much money, but this is awful because we're not helping anyone in the world. These guys don't understand that it's bootstrapping a global sound money is the best thing you could be doing for the world right now. It really is. And so they're embarrassed by the amount of money that's being made and the amount of wealth being created in this process of bootstrapping a global sound money. And they fundamentally have kind of an anti-capitalist mindset. And so because they're embarrassed about this success, they have to go find other ways of pretending that they're changing the world. I, I don't know why they're able to find that in CryptoKitties, but you know they'll also talk about you know, using the blockchain Ethereum for uh, pr providing refugee papers or voting on the blockchain or providing, you know, food aid on the blockchain. So there's all sorts of ways where they try to spin kind of non-monetary uh, applications of Ethereum because they're embarrassed be so. by the monetary application. Well, and it should be so simple just to work on Bitcoin and focus on making Bitcoin good, make their site easier to use. Uh, I don't understand why they don't adopt these ideas, but we had seen this years ago when they started to add Litecoin and Ethereum. We talked on our shows about a, a Cripsification. Uh, I'm not sure if many of the audience remember Cripsy, but Cripsy was a very famous altcoin exchange that started out with maybe 10 coins, 20 coins, 30, 100 coins, 200 coins. Cripsy added new coins every day. You had a new coin, Cripsy would add it. Uh, they were desperate for it. But what it is is things like Cripsy and BTC-E, Polynex, these early exchanges, they did make a lot of money on fees because they traded garbage. That's what I think Coinbase is not seeing, that Coinbase used to be a blue chip exchange. They traded Bitcoin, which for me is better than money, right? It's the right. best thing around. Uh, all these other things, they're nice ideas, but they're just, they're nothing compared to the 99.9% .9 of Bitcoin, which is it does its one thing and it does it well. Uh, does Coinbase not see that they're becoming cripsy? Do they not see the problem with chasing these altcoin profits? No, I, and I think that if you look at it, uh, Brian announced that he owns more F Ethereum ethers than he does Bitcoins. So as far as he's concerned, uh, he would rather, I think that what he wants to do, especially with the addition of Bcash, is try to dilute Bitcoin out and try to flip in Ethereum by promoting whether it's XRP or Bcash or uh, w whatever else comes next. Uh, and I think that it's kind of, a, at this point, an ideological drive more than a, a business drive for him. Uh, and the other thing, too, is that his Ethereum might be worth more than his equity stake in Coinbase at this point. So I think that he does have a strong conflict of interest. Um, and It's, it, it's yeah. strange how we've, we've ended up with these uh, people that originally started out to help Bitcoin, but now their motives and Bitcoin motives don't align. If you look at Bitcoin compared to Bcash, Bcash, they pretty much own the thing. Bitcoin is difficult to own. So it's no it's no reason why they wouldn't want to change from Bitcoin to Bcash or from Bitcoin to Litecoin or any other system where they have much, much more control over it. Uh, making an independent and free Bitcoin network is great for Bitcoin and great for the users doesn't necessarily enrich Coinbase, doesn't enrich Brian. If, if Ethereum goes up and you say he has a lot of them, that definitely enriches him. That enriches Coinbase. And they have a better chance at owning that network and, and manipulating and how it will grow because they could go straight to Vitalik. There's a person. There's a point of contact. Well, yeah, absolutely. And Brian thought that the point of contact for Bitcoin was the miners, right? He thought that Bitcoin was a miner democracy so that if he was and his buddies were able to lobby the miners to uh, accept a certain upgrade or whatever it may be, that uh, it would happen. And we saw with Segway2x that that theory is completely wrong. Bitcoin is not a minor democracy. Bitcoin has what's called network governance due to the fact that it is a peer-to-peer -peer network of nodes, not 90% uh, uh, of the miners controlling how the network works. The miners are hired by the network consensus. The miners are hired by this network of nodes to do our bidding and if they want to do something else, then they are welcome to fork and work on their own, you know, 
a hard fork, but uh, it's not Bitcoin. And it's, 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 so I think Brian was upset that uh, there's no one to, for him to call, pick up the phone and call and say, hey, we need a hard fork so that we can do X, Y, and Z. Uh, which obviously is not the case with uh, centralized systems like Ethereum or Ripple or Bcash. Well, and that's really what the Bcash thing is about. It's about the development team. People think it's about big blocks or small blocks or fees or slow transactions or fast transactions. It's about control of the development team. I think you're totally right. Brian wants to pick up the phone, say we need more transactions. We need it in six months. We have a deadline. We're a corporation. And Bitcoin development isn't working like that. It's working more like a science project. It's more like uh, Linux, but without a leader. It's uh, independent. It's You put your ideas on the mailing list. If your idea was just to make the blocks bigger forever, which would make the nodes impossible to run, and you would have to have one of those $20,000 uh, large servers that fake Satoshi's talked about, if that's your idea, that's a different idea than, than what the rest of us has. You can put it on the mailing list, and they disagreed. The people on the mailing list said, Eliminating the large number of nodes would make it easier to censor the network. And if it's easier to censor the network, then you can't send Bitcoin to anyone you want to, and Bitcoin doesn't work as well, and the core developers who are maintaining this airplane while we're flying this airplane. It's one thing to say, hey, we're going to start a brand new thing. But once you've been running this airplane for, I don't know, seven, eight years, nonstop, it never breaks, it never stops, it refuels in the air. This airplane just keeps circling the globe every day and never takes any breaks, doesn't take any weekends. Uh, you have to keep it every running. 10 minutes. Every 10 minutes. I love it. It's amazing. Uh, so let's move on to your next point, which is uh, pretty simple and, and surprising that Coinbase hasn't done this, especially considering some of their high account holders, which is create a secure hardware wallet and ship it to every customer. Coinbase be holding everyone's keys, even in a, a vault system that has multiple texts or multiple emails before you can withdraw. Uh, why would they want to do this with a hardware wallet? Uh, I don't know why they would not want to do this. Uh, th the reason why I think they would want to do this and I would want to make this a priority is to reduce the liability that Coinbase has. I think being a custodian is an extremely risky thing and we want to minimize that. And the whole point that we're having an on and off ramp from fiat to crypto is that we want to give people financial sovereignty. Uh, so I think that having a hardware wallet rather than a Coinbase web wallet is a key part of giving people their financial sovereignty and of educating them about what a private key is. Uh, quite a few Coinbase users don't know what a private key is. And so I think that the user education that comes with having a hardware wallet uh, is instrumental to promoting the vision of Bitcoin. I, I think this is also a big separator between uh, Coinbase, the company, and Coinbase, the Bitcoin company, and what's good for Bitcoin versus what's good for Coinbase. Uh, I think what's good for Bitcoin is Coinbase should have made a lot of educational documents about Bitcoin, how to deposit your money into a hardware wallet, why you can buy 0.001 of a Bitcoin, things like this. But again, that educates people about Bitcoin, which is this independent network that is not Coinbase. So if I'm Coinbase, I want everyone to hold their coins in me. I heard a rumor a while ago that they were trying to own all 21 million coins so that they could just hold them. And then you would just send your coins around in their database, uh, much like that tipping app from years ago where yeah. you take functions from Bitcoin and you recreate them in a central database. And now all the engineers have access and everyone can steal everyone's money. And it's a huge mental nightmare. Whereas Bitcoin, you're offloading all those things. You're saying this separate network is going to handle my payments. This separate network is going to handle holding the money uh, that you don't need to hold them in Coinbase. So I think that that's part of the confusion in Coinbase and their motives. If they were just a Bitcoin company, if they just thought more about the good of Bitcoin and that Bitcoin will succeed and will succeed too. But I think they can see in the future where Bitcoin succeeds and everyone stops using Coinbase. I think they yeah. see that and they need this hook. They need you to stay in. So they put your money in the vault or they only let you send to Coinbase customers or whatever they're going to try to do to keep you coming back, right? Yeah, and I, I think that that's it's it's kind of understandable that, hey, look, uh, if, if Coinbase's mission is to be an on and off ramp, an interface between fiat and Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, then if fiat is dead and we've had hyper-Bitcoinization, 
then what is the purpose of Coinbase at that point? And that's where I think that Daniel Krawitz's uh, theory of Bitcoin entrepreneurship is very important, which is that a your 90% of your investment should be owning Bitcoins. It should be hodling. And then the other 10% is a business like Coinbase. And so that way, when you're post hyper Bitcoinization, okay, yeah, your Coinbase business might be worth zero, but look, your hodlings are worth an astronomical amount. So uh, it turned out to be a, a fine uh, investment. I think that could be very hard for them to see. I think that's hard for them to believe in, hard for them to see. Yeah. And I mean, like Brian is not into Austrian economics. Brian is not into like analyzing monetary economics. So it's not surprising that it's it's hard for him to see the long term vision and he gets lost in crypto kitty ether huffing. Well, and part of this is that the philosophy of Bitcoin, the libertarian core philosophy of it is built into the rules. When you're limited to 21 million units, when you can only send one direction, when you don't receive any interest or any dividends or anything like that, you actually have to make the money to own the money. And if you own it, you actually own it. So it is a different system that they can't yeah. see. Uh, but yeah, I've also said that about Coinbase, that it's more of a bridge. It's something that we're going to cross over. It's not something that we're going to need for the long term. It's not a tower. It can't see far into the future. It's more of a like Cortez when he burned his ships when he reached the new world. Yeah, although I, I think that there there is an, an, uh, a niche for having a web wallet. Uh, there's a use case for having a web wallet. Um, I, I don't I don't really. I, it's just I, I don't think that all 21 million coins should be on the web on a web wallet. But uh, uh, and what about time, I don't think it would, be if there was a web wallet, would you put a limit like a thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars? Is there a cap? Would you try to cap it? Yeah, that might be a, a, the right approach. Uh, the other thing too is that if you're shipping a secure hardware wallet to your customers, you could have it so that when they buy Bitcoins, the coins automatically go to that hardware wallet, whether it's uh, using a real Bitcoin transaction or a payment channel or a Lightning Network. So essentially, the it kind of decentralizes things. And the interface could be through the Coinbase website. You have to revisit the website to get access to your hardware wallet. They get a chance to show you their new offerings, whatever the new thing yeah. is, sell you something. It's not, it's not the end of business, uh, but it would be losing control. And if I was Coinbase, I'd want to own everybody's coins. I'd want everybody can, coming back to me. I'd say, oh, you have to log into my website if you want your money. Uh, that's a pretty sweet thing to have. That's power over people. Yeah, so. that's true. All right, let's move on to point number seven, which you say pretty simply you say sponsor a few Bitcoin core developers. Now, why wouldn't Coinbase already do this right now? Uh, I know that MIT sponsors maybe one or two developers. Uh, Bitcoin Foundation used to sponsor a developer. There's a couple that have their own companies. They're kind of independent and free. There's not a lot of corporate sponsorship of uh, Bitcoin developers, shockingly enough. Uh, but again, this is about the separation of the, the motives of, of what they need. But uh, why would you change that at Coinbase? Yeah, uh, to, to give credit where credit's due, Brian has announced that they will hire uh, at least one uh, developer to work on any open source project uh, the developer wants to work on. I, I would want the developer to be working specifically on Bitcoin Core. And honestly, like if my platform is also trading altcoins, I would want to hire developers to be working on the node software for those altcoins as well. Uh, because not only does it allow you to have in-house expertise that a better a, gives you a better understanding of how your business should be interacting with the network, it also provides you with the confidence to say, "All right, well, we're okay with people buying this altcoin." Like, if if it turns out that this network is complete bullshit, then you could get sued as a business, conceivably, right? So you want to have a high level of confidence that the network that you are selling a token of actually exists and is a legitimate uh, decentralized project. So I think that there's an argument to be made to not only have Bitcoin core developers, but also have Ethereum uh, developers or uh, Litecoin developers on the payroll as well. Um, and then, so there's kind of that aspect of it, which is self-interested, right? It's, it's to the benefit of Coinbase to do that. And then there's an altruistic motive of, hey, let's, make sure that Bitcoin is the best network that it can be uh, by making sure that it has uh, the right features and the right uh, 
testing environment and the right amount of reliability that we would expect from critical financial infrastructure. See, now with this one, I'm always reminded of a quote from the David Mamet movie Heist. Uh, Gene Hackman says, he says, well, how do you do that? He says, well, I try to think of what someone smarter than me would do, and then I do that. Coinbase needs someone smarter than them. Uh, these Bitcoin core developers, or, or they're not, maybe they're not great at social skills or advertising, marketing, or whatever else Coinbase does, but they're great at being Bitcoin core developers, and they will give you the inside information on that. And that's what Coinbase needs. They need to hear that. They need to listen to that. If they had listened to a Bitcoin core developer years ago, they would have gotten this Lightning Network beta going. They'd have a beta wallet. They'd be on the right side, and they'd understand that we can't just scale Bitcoin by adding more roads. Doubling yeah. the block size forever is not a solution. Uh, and if we start doing it temporarily, we're going to end up like California, where we just keep adding roads, and now the roads are right up against the houses, and there's nothing we can do. We can't fit any more roads into our system. So. Yeah, so there's a danger of not having someone whispering into your ear who knows about what's what kind of the mindset of the Bitcoin core development process contributors are, is. And so you end up uh, making a fool of yourself by you know making PowerPoint presentations about how there's a minor democracy. It's, it's a big mistake not to listen to people smarter than you, but this is something Blake talks about all the time, the Dunning-Kruger effect. Smart people know that they're not the smartest, but dumb yeah. people think that they're the smartest wherever they are. Uh, so you got to watch out for that one. You have to, you know, think these thinking exercises, these uh, thought philosophy experiments, they really can help you work out of that box. Um, now, this next one, number eight, immediate IPO. Equity markets are thirsting for exposure. And unfortunately, you're also going to have to defend the idea. Why shouldn't Coinbase ICO? Why should they <laughs> IPO? Go ahead, Pierre. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think ICO at this point is just code for doing an unregistered securities offering. And the reason that you Shock. do- yeah. Shock. <laughs> the reason you do that is because you've exhausted the uh, legitimate avenues for acquiring financing. And I don't think that uh, Coinbase has, obviously. Like they, I think that they are a, a wildly profitable company. But that aside, um, you look at these stories of companies that are publicly traded that add blockchain to their name and then their stock price pops like 400%. So obviously there's a huge amount of demand among equity investors for exposure to this new world of cryptocurrencies. And Coinbase is, uh, I, I, it's just astounding to me that they haven't uh, put themselves on the stock market yet. They could have a very high PE ratio. And I think that the, um, the price that equity investors would pay is well above the fair value of Coinbase. And so if you're CEO of a company, it's incumbent upon you to issue shares when the uh, equity markets are overvaluing your company like this. It'd also be a good story for Bitcoin, spread the word around, get a Bitcoin company on the stock market change and an actual real one, not just a uh, Long Island iced tea changing their name to Long, I Long Blockchain. Uh, that was really pathetic. I, I agree with you. And even right here, where maybe uh, some of Coinbase's biggest critics, I would try to buy that IPO. Uh, oh, yeah. I would be hit by the, the, same, the same thing, though, that we're seeing with Bitcoin here, where uh, Bitcoin, I can get in early. Anyone can get in early. But with that IPO, it would be guarded by this house and guarded by that house and released to the market where there'd be a race. And maybe I'd get some in the race. Um, but otherwise I'd have to wait till it went up or down and then I'd have to make my choice and all the, the real money would already be made. Um, yeah. So I would, I would buy it anyway, but I wouldn't expect to get a, a good deal. <laughs> so. Yeah, and I think that you could get a better valuation from the public equity markets than you could from uh, VCs at this point. It's a good point. I don't know why they do it, especially for the uh, just the advertising alone. It's just yep. the, you want. And are you going to let somebody else be the first Bitcoin company on the stock market? Overstock or BitPay? Uh, uh, Overstock is going to go public, maybe. I don't know. So. Yeah, Overstock's actually is is publicly traded, and they have benefited from uh, dabbling in crypto. And we also saw that the Square price went up. Uh, the Square stock went up when they announced that they were uh, using or going to have Bitcoin buying and selling on their platform. So uh, yeah, it's, it's an over AMD and AMD and Intel have also seen gains because they're producing uh, chips that are used for mining. So right. there's a lot of Bitcoin gains in the stock market and Coinbase. It could be you. Uh, think about it. 
Number nine, add more fiat currencies and countries uh, to enable speculative attacks. Why would you want to enable a speculative attack? So uh, a speculative attack is when uh, investors borrow in the weak currency. So uh, for example, here in the US, that would be US dollars. But really, I mean, you could be uh, in Venezuela or whatever. And because of how fractional reserve, reserve banking works, when you borrow a fiat currency, they actually print more of it. And if you go and use that to go buy Bitcoins, you kind of, or the, any stronger currency, but in this case, Bitcoin, uh, you have a, a, a vicious cycle and that's called a speculative attack. Uh, this term was actually coined by Paul Krugman. Uh, he was describing what happened to Asian uh, countries, uh, currencies during the 90s uh, Asian financial crisis. But anyway, um, so it is, it is it's very important to have highly liquid, highly well-connected uh, exchanges and brokerages in every country, in every denomination that any anyone can access through their, uh, by transferring from their bank, whether they're in Europe or in Africa or in Japan or in the US. And so I think that, you know, if you take that money that you made from doing an IPO and you use it, you could even use it to like, you go, go to another foreign country and be like, hey, we're buying this bank. Okay. All right. Well, now you've got yourself, a, 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 you've got your foot in the door and you can then um, essentially, you could lend out to people to buy Bitcoins. You could encourage leveraged Bitcoin speculation. Uh, and now, granted, you don't want to do this with retail customers, right? You don't want people taking out a mortgage to buy Bitcoins. That's like, that's crazy. And people rightly get criticized for that. But if you're an investor who has a portfolio of assets, you know, you've got bonds and stocks and whatnot, and you feel pretty strongly about Bitcoin, and it's, you know, not totally crazy for you to borrow against your stocks and bonds and buy some crypto. And I think so, this also goes back to uh, Daniel Krawitz's idea of the hyper Bitcoinization. If Coinbase was a company that really believed in Bitcoin, like they had, you know, feelings, they weren't just getting in on the new hip thing to make a lot of money, which is what it seems like. If they really believed in the philosophy of Bitcoin and Bitcoin taking over the world, uh, the idea that Bitcoin would go to infinity and that we're sucking in all of the world's value, what you said with the fiat attack is such a good idea bringing in that fiat, letting them print more, bringing in that fiat, letting them print more. This would be great for Bitcoin, but you need that larger vision. You need that ability to say, you know, this company has 90% of its holdings in Bitcoin, so we're going to win if Bitcoin wins. They need to link the victories together, and I'm not sure they've done that. I think Brian's probably holding Ethereum or dollars or nothing, and I don't think they have any loyalty. And I think when you don't have loyalty, it shows. I think people yeah. eventually figure that out. It's a lack of loyalty and it's a, it's a lack of confidence in the underlying fundamentals. And I, I think that I, clearly Brian didn't even understand the underlying fundamentals since he thought it was a minor democracy. So already it does make sense that he, it, may, it may have been wishful it. thinking. Let's let's give him some chance here. He, he <laughs> okay. may have wanted it to be a minor democracy so he could uh, smooth things over quickly and get back to work. It, it was a yeah. wishful thinking. Yeah. Bitcoin does not care about what you want. <laughs> Uh, that's too bad too bad and more things that you want let's move on to your most questionable point number 10 move the headquarters to austin texas is this some uh in my backyard here are you in austin texas pierre uh i'm not uh, i definitely did throw this in just for fun uh i'm not particularly attached to this but uh, i did go to college at uc austin and i think it's a great city uh, and it would also get get the company out of the Silicon Valley group think that uh, leads you to thinking that crypto kitties are uh, important compared to uh, establishing a global sound money. I would definitely give you two points on this. I'd give you the group think that is one thing that most of the people in Silicon Valley uh, don't have loyalty, don't have philosophy, don't have any of these things we're talking about, don't have long term vision, don't have historical mindset. They have make money. That's, that's what they have. They have make money with technology. That's what they're into. And I'd also give you that San Francisco is too damn expensive. As yeah. a person that loves San Francisco but fled from San Francisco, it's too damn expensive. And if, that, if you're doing that to your company, you're doing that to your runway, you're doing that to your employees, you're doing that to everybody. Whereas 
Austin, I think it's probably turned around, probably on its way up, no doubt. Uh, but your employees could have a house. I think it'd be a little nicer than uh, living in one house, living in bunk beds, uh, whatever else they're doing in San Francisco. Yeah, the Hill Country is beautiful and there's plenty of uh, room to grow there. All right. So I think we've gone through your 10 points pretty strongly. Uh, is there anything else before we go into audience questions? If you're in the chat right now, go ahead and send us a question. Uh, try to make them polite. If you want to send us a super chat question, uh, we'll answer those first. Uh, but no pressure. I don't, I don't care if you do it or not. Uh, but send us some questions here. We did have one question earlier in the chat. Uh, they speculated, what if you took over Coinbase and found out that they had no money? What would you do then? I think that, you know, so, I mean, obviously there's kind of a legal process when a company is insolvent, but that aside, uh, recapitalizing it by doing an IPO, right? I think that that would pretty much instantly solve the problem. So and similar if, to the way uh, Bitfinex printed their own token, you would just print an IPO legitimate stock, right? Yeah. And if that diluted Brian's share and Fred's founding share, and if that diluted A16Z and all the other VCs, uh, then so be it. I mean, they they really they they blew it in this scenario, and uh, it's time for the public to benefit from Coinbase success. All right, so we've got a question. It's a little um, provocatively framed, but why does Ethereum suck? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, so uh, <laughs> there's a lot of different I'll, I'll, I'll uh, angles. I'll give you, I'll to, give to you a question. start here for me. When yeah. I looked at the project, they could print an endless amount of units. So when I bought Bitcoin, I wanted to buy something with a fixed amount of units. That's important to me. Um, additionally, when I looked at Ethereum, the project, they had a huge pre-mine that they gave to all of their developers and supporters. So they were all going to be and are now very rich. Uh, so big pre-mine, uh, endless printing of units, which is also called inflation. Uh, the contracts, have you run a smart contract today? I haven't. Uh, they mainly seem to be used for ICOs and printing money, uh, which is a far cry from the Turing Complete World computer that we were all promised. Uh, what else would you add, Pierre? What else is going on? And the, the rollback with the DAO, changing the chain, not being immutable. There's a lot of questionable things about Ethereum, but that said, a lot of serious people are excited about it. A lot of people put their money into it. It's a huge project now. Uh, you know, we still have the same doubts. Yeah, I mean, let's let's see how it scales, right? We know that when when Bitcoin scales, it becomes expensive to send transactions over the network. Uh, we don't so far. You know, we've we've did a little stress test with the Crypto Kitties and saw that uh, it it choked up the network. But uh, let's see as it gets more success, uh, what that looks like. I, I, I'm not holding out hope, but uh, there actually, I think that this ties into a good question I saw, which is, um, can Pierre define Bitcoin Maximus and why is he one? And I think this is really why I, I think Ethereum sucks. And uh, to be frank, all the altcoins do as well, which is that uh, the, the market for money is kind of a winner take most market. Uh, and the reason that that is the case is that using a bunch of different monies on a day-to-day -day basis is a complete pain in the ass. Uh, you can ask anyone who lived in Europe before the Euro existed and who was traveling around Europe uh, how annoying that was. And so they created the Euro to consolidate all of these currencies. So now they did that through a political process, but it also happens through an economic process. And today, de facto, the US dollar is kind of the world reserve currency. Um, and so I think that because Currency is a, a winner take most market, uh, and Bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency that had a credible monetary policy, like uh, you know the 21 million cap. That just due to the fact that it's oldest and it's furthest ahead in its network effects, that ultimately it will be the winner. And that's that's how I that's how I would define Bitcoin maximalism. And I would also add to that though that uh, to me the the whole idea of oh well you know we'll use rootstock and we'll have uh, smart contracts on bitcoin as well okay that's plausible marketing but i don't even really think that bitcoin's that valuable for that use case anyway and i, I don't really see much value in smart contracts uh i look forward to being proven wrong but uh, it, regardless money is half of every transaction in the world half of every monetary transaction in the world and so just mathematically it's much bigger than any contract application 
I do agree with you. It's very difficult to use currency when each country has a different one. I did go to Europe recently and I was mainly on the euro, but I went to Prague and I went to Hungary who both had their own currency and I ended up with a wad of that currency that I was carrying around. It was losing and gaining value. I have a bunch of random coins still. It's still a big mess. Uh, but we do have a question from Thomas Dieter who gave us a super chat. Thanks, Thomas. He says, could Coinbase give an option to have BTC that you buy automatically put into a lightning channel that is already established with popular retailers and other Coinbase users? Is something like that possible? Yeah, uh, thanks, Thomas, first of all. And second, I think that I agree that that is it's possible, but really the promise of lightning is that the routing makes it so that it doesn't matter whether the channel is directly connecting you with uh, specific retailers or other Coinbase users. Uh, now, Coinbase could definitely help with the routing and thus you know, make sure that that happens. But the idea is that if Lightning really is a peer-to-peer -peer network that functions on its own merits and on its own incentives, that uh, you wouldn't need a centralized party like Coinbase to help route payments. So you could have a payment channel that's open uh, a lightning channel that's open between you, the Coinbase user, and Coinbase because they're going to send you Bitcoins when you send them fiat. Uh, and then from there, you can uh, route it to whatever merchant you want to use or a Coinbase user you want to send to. A lot of people have uh, mentioned that the Lightning Network will have kind of a credit union model, that there is a need for kind of a super node where Coinbase or another company could play a role, always being present, always being on the network, because the rest of the time, I understand it is like handing someone a hot dog at a ball game. I get it, you get it, they get it, the money gets back, I get it, you get it, they get it. It goes back and forth, up and down the line. So it's more like just handing around small payments uh, than Bitcoin and the transactions. Yeah, and I mean, it, that it's cryptographically secured, right? And it's automated. So uh, hopefully as a user, you wouldn't even realize that uh, the payment went through a number of uh, jumps. But we'll, we'll see how it Lightning shakes out. And, you know, it, if Lightning uh, delivers on the promises that uh, people are making, then that'll be great. If it doesn't, I'm sure we'll think of something else. And uh, worst case scenario, uh, we have to raise the block size limit, but I'm holding out hope. All right, so we have a couple more questions. We're going to go to lightning fire questions. Would you add Ripple to Coinbase? Uh, yes, in the sense that I would add Ripple to our uh, umbrella of different brands. So Coinbase itself would only be Bitcoin, and Ripple I would put on, uh, you know, Ripple base or whatever brand name we come up with that appeals to that market. Uh, and you know we would use some of the same engineering resources and uh, the same corporate resources, but they would be in a separate legal entity on a separate website on separate uh, hardware. All right, do you speak French? We. Oh, he's Je ready. Oh, now, now you're qualified to be the Coinbase CEO. Before, we weren't so sure, but now that you speak French, oh, it's on. Um, let's see. They're ragging on me. I've never said I was a libertarian. I'm a fan of Bitcoin. I believe that Bitcoin itself has libertarian values. I believe it has some libertarianism breaked into the rules, but I don't believe that expands beyond Bitcoin. Just because you touch Bitcoin doesn't make you a libertarian, doesn't make you believe in libertarian values. Even if you do support, say, like the three rules of Bitcoin, like 21 million units, uh, one way directional sending, um, no inflation, I don't know, whatever you want to, the, the halvening structure, whatever you want to pick as your three rules of Bitcoin. I support those rules. Uh, we're starting to run out of questions. Uh, Pierre, do you have anything else you'd like to add about Coinbase? Any, do you want to put a message out to the creditors, say, I'm here. This is why you should consider me as the CEO. Well, I mean, obviously, this started out as kind of a, a Twitter trolling campaign, uh, but I've actually I've been surprised by how many responses I've gotten from people asking me to advise them on their creation of a Coinbase competitor. So hopefully 2018 brings out some really interesting new competitors and uh, that puts pressure on Coinbase and on Brian to 
uh, take Bitcoin more seriously and uh, start adopting and promoting some of these new Bitcoin technologies. All right. And uh, thanks to everybody for watching. We had a great time today in the chat. I'm going to check that out later. We're about out of time for this show. Uh, so Pierre, where can they check you out? Where can they check out your work right now? Yeah, uh, so I co-founded the Nakamoto Institute with Michael Goldstein and Daniel Krawitz. So uh, go to nakamotoinstitute.org. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Pierre underscore Rochard. Uh, and also I co-host the Noted podcast, N-O-D-E-D, -E with uh, Michael Goldstein. So definitely go to noted.org and follow at Noted Podcast. Uh, we try to put out at least maybe two episodes a month, more or less. Um, we're on our sixth episode. So go there, catch up, uh, listen to uh, all of our interesting guests talk about Bitcoin. All right, great. Well, thank you, Pierre, very much for being on the show. Enjoy talking about your ideas for Coinbase today. And be sure to check out that Nakamoto Institute who founded the term hyper Bitcoinization. I like that one. And uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for being on. Make sure everybody to like and share, subscribe, uh, subscribe down below if you haven't. We're up to around 68% subscribed, 32% not subscribed. So if you're in the 32%, push that subscribe button. If you've already subscribed, you want to click the little bell next to the subscription button. That'll give you a notification every time we go on. Uh, everybody have a great happy new year. It's around 12.01 p.m. here in California. So I guess we're over it. We're in the new year. Oh, no, that's the next 12. Oh, clocks are so confusing. Uh, but if it's New, Year, New Year's where you are, please celebrate it. Be safe. Uh, don't drink and drive. Take care of yourselves. Don't drink too much anyway. It just makes you sick. Uh, but have a great time. And until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>